Well, this time last year, I was just returning from some time at sea in the Galapagos Islands. It was an expedition that came as a result of partial fulfillment of a wish that I made thanks to an organization called TED, Technology Entertainment Design, something that has been around for about 26 years now. Every year they invite speakers to come to a conference out in California, and you're given 18 minutes to give the talk of your life. It has to be something that, you know, you want the world to know what really matters to you. And when I got a call from Chris Anderson, who is known as the curator of TED, I thought, oh, I'm going to be given a chance to give the talk of my life. What I didn't know is I was also going to be given a chance to articulate a wish. I was one of the TED Prize winners that the prize mostly is you're given a chance to get the Tedsters behind you to implement some wish, a wish big enough to change the world. Now, there are a lot of little wishes that I could make. I want to go diving in Hawaii. I'd like to go, <laughs> you know, off to an expedition to be with the whales. But this wish had to be something really big. And that was easy because it's what I've been working for for many years, most of my life, actually. It was getting it into 18 minutes that was difficult. <laughs> well, tonight I want to share with you something about what that wish was, is, and I hope will be, and to take you aboard, for a moment at least, the expedition to the Galapagos Islands. The wish was really asking those assembled, and I can ask you because it's like asking the world, to use your powers, whatever they are, the web, science, music, art, math, whoever, whatever you are, to ignite public support around the concept of protecting the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. And that means targeting special places in the ocean that if we protect them, really do provide hope, not just for the ocean, but for all of us who really, one way or the other, depend on the ocean for every breath we take, every drop of water we drink, for our very existence. It anchors back into the existence of the blue part of the planet. So could we have that first little video clip, please? I'll take you out to the Galapagos. Fifty years ago, when I began exploring the ocean, it seemed at that time to be a sea of Eden. But now we know we are now facing paradise lost. This trip is absolutely brand new for Ted. We've never done anything like it before. The trip came about because of a wish that Ted granted Sylvia Earle. I hope for your help to explore and protect the wild ocean in ways that will restore the health and, in so doing, secure hope for humankind. Sylvia Earle has devoted her life to this passion of the oceans. And the need for knowledge about all aspects of the environment, whether on the land or on the sea. I've always been a scientist. I am a scientist. But I've been transformed in part, I suppose, by having children and seeing that the places I knew as a child, I can't take them because they're gone. The trip is a bet that if you bring together a group of really remarkable people who are well-resourced, some of the world's greatest marine scientists, some of the world's great storytellers, you put them together and you show them what's happening in the oceans, something incredible is going to happen. I was raised with a great respect for nature, but I'd never added the ocean to that. And to be able to be in a place like the Galapagos, to actually get into the water and see some of the creatures that we're talking about has changed my life. Getting people to not only understand intellectually, but to know with their hearts that we're so changing the way the world works that our future is at risk. The type of fishing going on today is really wiping bluefin ecologically off the planet. 
whale meat being sold in these markets was really dolphin meat and it was toxic. There's uh, around 100 million sharks caught every year. So this is a, a truly global problem. We're literally sucking like a straw life right out of this planet. And so the idea of hope spots, the idea of protected areas is like, whoa, you know? But it's gotta be big and it's gotta be real and you gotta have people with guns out there to protect it because it sure as hell isn't going to be protected by wishful thinking or let's all go off and sing Gumbaya. But if we wait another 50 years or even another 10 years, things we can do now will be gone. There is no more tomorrow that we can avoid confronting has declared a state of emergency because of the spill. What's at stake for the environment as the oil begins to touch land? And to me, crude oil ain't nothing but the devil. Man is destroying the planet. Just like the Bible says. In greed and time, you will destroy your own earth, and that's what's happening. In Mississippi are trying to gauge the impact of the spill as it starts to spread into the prime habitat of the biggest fish in the Gulf. So these animals are here to feed during this time, and this oil spill is right in their backyard. The they're on death row. If for nothing else good comes of this major spill, it may be to wake up people to say we have to protect the Gulf. There are real issues here of money and power. It's life itself that the ocean is delivering. And we have been abusing the ocean. We haven't been caring for the ocean. Why don't we write to 100 world leaders? There must be some place where these forests of unique creatures can be safe. And Sylvia's timing is perfect. This is that moment. The government is on board. This bill is not only, we've heard it's the first in the United States, this is the first in the world. We're 100 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. On corals, you're just looking at brown, gunky stuff. A great grand finale for this version of the Alvin. We need every bit of insight that we can muster. The ocean is alive. Without the ocean, life on Earth simply would not exist. I do not want to envision a world for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren that doesn't have orcas, that doesn't have hammerhead sharks, because we're all connected. I'm here because Sylvia Earle is one of the most remarkable women on Earth. She's the real thing. She's a person who has committed herself and everything that that commitment implies. And we need more of that. We have the capacity to protect the systems that keep us alive. We still have a chance, but now's the time. So now is the time. Now is the time. <laughs> If only we could go back 50 years armed with what we now know and start over with a fuller deck than we now have remaining. But we still have time. We still have maybe 10% of some of the big fish in the sea that have been depleted by 90% since the middle of the 20th century. We still have coral reefs. About half are still in pretty good shape. Of course, we've lost we're seeing a serious decline of about half. There isn't a lot of time to fool around and imagine what can we do to secure the integrity of the only speck in the universe that is a suitable place for the likes of us. I've been asked sometimes, why should I care about the ocean? <laughs> and the questions sometimes go on to say, Oh, uh, well, let's see. I get seasick. I don't eat fish. I don't swim. But people don't drink salt water. So what if the ocean dried up? Why should I care? What difference would it make to me? And I have come to think, well, okay, get rid of the ocean. You've got a planet 
much like our beautiful sister planet, Mars. The red planet apparently did have an ocean once upon a time. It still does have water. Maybe there's life there, but it's not very hospitable for us. Mars, also four and a half billion years in history, but it didn't turn out the way this planet has. We have a planet that works for us. Ironically, while some would like to turn Mars into a place more like Earth to basically terraform Mars, we, on this planet, perversely seem to be aimed for doing something that you could call Marsifying Earth. We're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're stripping the planet of its wildlife, of its green tapestry of life, and the ocean now is also proving to be vulnerable. We didn't know 50 years ago that we had the capacity to basically alter the nature of nature, to change the temperature of the planet, to amp it up. Although ice ages have come, ice ages have gone, polar ice has melted, polar ice has recovered over many, many phases in the past. But there appears to be nothing quite like what we're going through now with us putting our finger on the fast forward button in terms of the speed of change that is unprecedented in history, certainly unprecedented in the history of humankind. Now, not all of the changes that have happened in my lifetime have been bad, for heaven's sakes. I'm so pleased that there are medical breakthroughs that, that we now enjoy, or sources of food, understanding how to communicate on the other side of the planet. Television didn't exist when I was a, a kid at first. Uh, and to understand what we now can see that we just could not know because we hadn't been up in space to look back on Earth until the middle of the 20th century and during the years since. We have information now that ought to put us on a track toward an enduring future. We know enough to realize that we have to take measures to secure not just a future for polar bears. We may, no matter what, lose polar bears. It would be sad if that happens to be the case. If, if they have the capacity to adapt maybe they can pull through the tight spot that is ahead for them. Our success, humankind's success so far, has rested on our amazing adaptability, our, our gift of being able to change with time, with different circumstances, to turn the natural world around us to our advantage. But now we know that there is a point beyond which we can use the planet's resources to a stage where it's not to our advantage. Part of our new understanding comes with the gift of being able to develop technologies to go explore the blue part of the planet. My great-grandfather, even my grandfather, even my father did not come along at a time when it was possible to jump in the ocean with scuba my mother was 81 before, for the first time, she put on a mask and flippers, and she was so cross with me. She said, why didn't you get me in the ocean sooner? And I thought I'd tried, <laughs> but I obviously didn't try hard enough, but she advised me to tell anybody who's 81, don't wait any longer. <laughs> and if you're more than 81, the same message. As long as you breathe, you can dive. I'm living proof. And if you don't like to get wet, there are always submarines out there, new ones. I long for the day when there will be Hertz Renesubs. <laughs> they don't exist yet, but it's out there. It will happen. Already, there are places that you can go live underwater. I've done it nine times. Starting in 1970, I had a chance to spend two weeks underwater and had a chance really to see the ocean as a laboratory, but more than that, as a neighborhood. Later, I had a chance to dive in the Florida Keys with, with none other than Fred Rogers, and we went into the fish's neighborhood. <laughs> he took off his fins, he put on uh, his uh, shoes, his, his, uh, his tennis shoes, whatever he was wearing, and put on his fins, and he took off his, his sweater, and he put on his skins, and we jumped in the ocean, and we really did get to see the creatures there on their own terms, and 
If you have not done this, do not wait. <laughs> Even in lakes, rivers, and streams, it's one thing to be on the surface, it's another to be underwater, to see that water everywhere is not just water. It's alive, it's filled with creatures, it's an ecosystem, starting with the really tiny things, but right on up in the ocean to the largest creatures on the planet. I've had the fun, too, of putting on strange and wonderful submarines that look like diving suits. This is one atmosphere on the inside. So I, in this case, could go down 400 meters, 1,250 feet, no decompression. Come right back after spending two and a half hours walking on the ocean floor, four hours total round-trip journey. There are so many ways that we can now use the technologies that have taken us high in the sky, just go in reverse, go down in the sea. It's ironic, though. There are thousands of aircraft, thousands of ships, a handful of submersibles that can take us into the depths. This is one version. There are about 20 of these in existence. Little one-person subs, so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. I'm one, I'm, again, here to tell you. About 100 scientists and others, school teacher, the CEO of the National Geographic, uh, and others that we lured into the depths using this little submersible during a project called the Sustainable Seas Expeditions. Five years of exploring the coastline of this country, tiptoeing down into Mexico and Belize between 1999 and 2003. Looking at the world from the inside down out to a depth, using this sub down to 2,000 feet, another version down to 1,000 meters, a little more than 3,000 feet. Still, that's just the upper part of the ocean where the average depth is two and a half miles. This little sub that operates off Cocos Islands, off Costa Rica, can go to 500 meters. That is wonderful in a way because you can get down to the doo-doo-doo-doo twilight zone. <laughs> it is such a great place. It's where it's almost dark, almost light. You can get just below the twilight zone in this little sub. I have a friend, Richard Pyle, at the University of Hawaii. He goes using a rebreather into the twilight zone, three to four, five hundred feet below the surface, and he discovers between 12 and 13 new species of fish per hour of looking around. It just goes to show you how little we know of the ocean. Only about 5% has been seen let alone explored or mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the moon or Mars or Jupiter. What are we thinking? I'm all for pouring whatever resources we can into the exploration of the skies above. It's given us such amazing perspective, such incredible, valuable technology. We just need equal, at least equal, commitment in terms of our resources devoted to understanding the ocean, and we're far from doing so. Other countries are really ahead of us in many respects. Russia has two submersibles that can go to at least half the ocean's depth or to the bottom of some of the deep lakes. I was with James Cameron, the Avatar Titanic filmmaker, celebrating his birthday at the bottom of, of um, Lake Baikal last August using this submarine that probably wondered what it was doing in a lake. <laughs> but for the most part, it's been out exploring the deep seas of the world. The other submersibles that are in that league are uh, one that is owned by Japan, one that is owned by France, and one that is under, under uh, trials right now in, in um, China. The United States had a 6,000-meter submersible called Seacliff up until the year of the ocean, ironically, 1998, and then it was decommissioned, and we haven't had access to those depths since, except with robots. And now, fortunately, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution does have a system capable of going to full ocean depth. It's been there nine times, bringing back news of the creatures that live even in the deepest sea, where, 50 years ago, a lot of people imagined that there was no life or so little that it was not even worth considering in the deep sea. Pressure, cold, distance from where life as we know it exists, was sort of put off as not important. 
But in 1960, two men in a submersible much larger than this one, a gasoline-filled flute and a tiny little steel ball in which they crouched going to the deepest part of the ocean for about 30 minutes. Jacques Picard and Don Walsh presently are the only two people ever to go seven miles into the depths of the ocean and come back. Uh, One-way trips, really easy. (laughs) Everyone, even with a mask and snorkel, everyone who goes into the ocean can quickly see what those who just stay on the surface have a hard time just visualizing, getting it, that the ocean is alive. It's full of life from the surface to the greatest depths. It's a living system. It isn't just H2O plus salt. It's, a, it's just amazing how much is there. In the single gulp of a whale shark, you may get more diversity in terms of the big wedges of life, the phyla of animals, the categories of life that make up life on Earth, then, arguably, then you can find on all of the land put together. Fifteen or so phyla of animals could be engulfed in the plankton that are swallowed by a whale shark. And that's about the number of phyla of animals that occur in all of the rainforests, all of the, all of the area above water put together. We're just beginning to appreciate the diversity of life that we share space with on this planet. We're just beginning to assign names to most of the creatures that are out there. According to the census of marine life that came to some kind of a conclusion after 10 years of looking with thousands of scientists around the world working to kind of get a grip on how many of what kind of creatures live in the ocean, they came up with a figure of some 250,000 that were recorded with names and some little bit of information, sometimes a lot of information. But what they also discovered is the magnitude of our ignorance. The estimate is at least a million, probably closer to something between 10 and 50 million species, if you want to go down to the splintery ends of diversity, out there in the ocean. But we just plain don't know. What we are beginning to appreciate, though, is that it matters. It matters. This is the distillation of the history of life through the history of of all that preceded the present time. I mean, a shrimp is not a shrimp is not a shrimp. Many variations on the theme of starfish. Odd-looking, brittle stars that seem to dance in the deep sea. So many different kinds of decapods, crabs, and their relatives. And the cephalopods, the, the the squids, the octopuses, the nautiluses, relatives of clams and oysters, but with a brain and eyes that are hauntingly like our own. The thing that I learned and I continue to discover is every creature, every one, every turtle, every octopus, every squid is different. Just as if one of them came swimming through this room, they'd probably look around and they'd say, well... They all look alike to me, but if they really looked, looked really carefully, they might discover what you can discover if you go to an aquarium or go to the big aquarium, a big lake or a big river or the ocean. Like any cat, any dog, every kid, they're all different. They not only, they not only look different, but they act different. They all have little quirks in their personality. The school of fish, at first glance, might seem to be kind of all alike, like a cookie cutter made every one of them. But if you really look, none have their stripes arranged in exactly the same way. And they certainly don't behave in the same way. No two parrotfish of this kind with freckles arranged exactly the same. And groupers will tell you there aren't any two alike. But how would you know if you only see them swimming with lemon slices and butter? You know? (laughs) We have so much to learn about respecting the creatures who share space with us, especially those in the sea that presently are regarded mostly as pounds of meat rather than, as we have belatedly come to think about birds, we used to think of them primarily as something to eat, but now we have a few species that we cultivate to eat. We don't have Kentucky Fried Bird. We have Kentucky Fried, well, usually chicken, I think, um, and with respect to burgers, it's, uh, you know, it's not 
not a mammal burger, <laughs> but you get fish and chips. You get catch of the day. You, you get fish chowder. What kind of fish? There are 25,000 variations on the theme of it. We think of them as pounds of meat instead of the enormous individuality, the personality, the place that they occupy in the sea that in many ways is comparable to the place that birds and mammals occupy on the land. They're important to the ecosystem, important to the way the world works. And as we come to appreciate that and understand it and think about the value of these creatures, think of the ocean as a living system, not just rocks and water, maybe a few minerals here that are of some... Maybe our attitude about the ocean can and will change. Even sharks have different faces, and no, they're not out to get us, although I used to think that. When I started diving years ago, I was warned, seriously, watch out for the sharks. There are man-eaters out there. <laughs> and then I thought about it and realized I don't qualify. And then... <laughs> <laughs> But now we have to worry about men and women eating sharks, literally. Only about 10% of the big sharks that were around when I was a kid are still there. I mean, in terms of the, the volume, the numbers. Now they live a long time. Some of the sharks that were there when I was a kid might still be out there. I mean, it's not uncommon for sharks to be 80, 90 years old. It takes a long time for them to mature. Some of them take 20 years to even get to the point where they can make more sharks. And they have very few young, so they're really vulnerable to the kind of mass extraction that we are currently imposing on them, largely to satisfy a, a newly acquired taste for shark fin soup. But there are other things. You know, Mako steak, you can get thresher shark steaks in various restaurants and in supermarkets. It's like finding, you know, lions and tigers um, snow leopard and, and kangaroo well kangaroo is sometimes eaten in, with abandon in Australia it's a wild animal but you know ah, when are we going to get it through our minds that this is wildlife out there in the ocean and that maybe we should think of it in terms of valuing it alive rather than just on our plates the changes in coral reefs really important to know Maybe if all the coral reefs in the world disappeared, the life world could go on without them, but it would be a diminished world. It would be a less resilient world. It would be a less complete world. And already, as I said, about half of them are gone, or they're in a state of great and sharp decline. The chance to cause them to recover, or bring about their recover, is anchored in a number of things that we can do, partly by not stripping coral reefs of the fish that live there, the lobsters that live there that are part of what make those systems work. But it also has to do with the, the warming trend that we're experiencing around the globe, driven by our actions. But really, one of the things that can be done, that all of us can do, is know what we're eating and vote with our forks. We can do this. Bluefin tuna. They are amazing creatures that cause engineers... I've actually heard engineers sigh with envy when they think about bluefin tuna because they can travel faster than a nuclear submarine. When they swish the tail back and forth, they capture the energy so that about 97% is, is maintained to speed them through the ocean. And the best thing we can think to do with them is sushify them. It really does say something kind of Neanderthal-like about us that we think first of some of the wild creatures that share space with us on the planet is, hmm, I wonder if it's going to eat me. Or even more commonly, hmm, I wonder if I can eat it. We used to think that way largely about whales. Whales were considered commodities. They still are in some parts of the world. This is the Tokyo fish market last August. But we, in time, have come to think of whales with new eyes, with a broader perspective, something that perhaps we can bring to all of the natural world to realize we know how to destroy these things. And some think, well, so what? What difference does it make to me? But little by little, as we have seen the, the loss of that which keeps 
holds the planet steady, we're beginning to appreciate the need to maintain these creatures alive and their value. More important alive than dead. And there's more than one way to cause their har- cause harm. It's not just deliberately killing them, it's the trash we put in the ocean, the lost nets, the poisons we allow to flow in the sea. This is a good news story, because I found this turtle, and we were able to release it from the little fishing float that had become entangled, and it went off to perhaps a good long life. And this is another good news story. This is just a few weeks of gathering old fishing nets from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. It's a protected area, but these are old nets that have clogged the ocean now for decades, now being recovered, and may appear soon in a polar fleece near you, one hopes. (laughs) This was my backyard as a kid, growing up, well, first in New Jersey, later in Florida, and I knew the Gulf of Mexico was a place where these floating golden forests of sargassum provided shelter for an amazing zoo of little creatures. I love diving under the sargassum and seeing these, these creatures. I love the mangrove forests and the roots that were loaded with young fish and young crabs, young shrimp, nursery areas, or the seagrass meadows that also were vast places that generated oxygen, grabbed carbon, and provided shelter, nursery areas for small creatures. And later, I got to go into the deep part of the Gulf of Mexico, a hundred miles off the mouth of the Mississippi River and 1,800 feet down in that little deep worker submarine. I driving myself and looked out and saw these tube worms that were thriving in natural methane seeps in the bottom of that, that oil and gas rich part of the planet. And subsequently heard about the existence of some of these wonderful deep sea creatures, the biggest calamari in the, in the world. One thing I will never be able to see is a monk seal that once lived in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Can you imagine seals on Miami Beach? Seals as far north as Galveston? They're gone. The last one seen, 1952. We don't have to let that happen with manatees and the other creatures that still do live in the Gulf and the Caribbean, in the oceans of the world. But we have to look with care on what remains of these systems. And again, by this time last year, I was among those, you probably were too, riveted at what was happening in the Gulf of Mexico with scenes such as this. They just break your heart because you know it's not necessary. We can figure out how to extract if we choose to continue to do so without really causing the kinds of problems that were upon us, upon the Gulf, upon the world last last summer. Last December, I went out on the ship, the Atlantis, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I did not use Alvin, but was with the scientists who did, who went down in the uh, submersible, 5,000 feet beneath the surface. It is ironic. This is currently the deepest diving submarine that we have in this country, and it can go to the average depth of the ocean. There are two others out in Hawaii, the Pisces subs, built in the early 1970s. How many airplanes are you flying that were built in the 1970s? (laughs) Not too many. (laughs) But there we are. We really need to apply our skills, our, our fortunes, our technologies into understanding the ocean. This little sub I got to use in January of this year and got to dive off Pensacola, Florida, that is legendary for its beautiful clear water, but not so clear these days. It was like diving in green jello with fruit. The thing is, we now know what we could not know just a few decades ago. That arms us with insight, with a capacity to do what no other creature on the planet can do. That is to shape the future in a way where we have a chance, where we really can, by taking actions to protect nature, to connect with nature. I think, in terms of education, we should have a big project, a big theme, right along with learning your ABCs and your one, two, threes, no child should be left dry. (laughs) We need to get them out there, get them wet, get them connected with the creatures on the land and in the sea to see that we're a part of nature, not apart from it. We need to seek that place, 
that we could not do 50 years ago or 500 or 5,000 because we did not see ourselves in perspective or know that we have the capacity to really undermine the very planet that keeps us alive. Now we know. Now we have the ability to find an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that sustain us. And I have several good reasons for wanting to do this because I have three kids, I have four grandkids, and I tell people if they want to get perspective, go get a kid. (laughs) And if you don't have one of your own, borrow one. (laughs) And go out into some good wild wet place and look at the future through their eyes. Imagine that you're going to be where they'll be in the next 50 years. And then ask the question, do you want to live there with the world as it is now trending? What is the world, what, what kind of world do you want, even for yourself, in the next 10 years? Because the next 10 years are likely to be the most important in the next 10,000 years. Because we're right on the edge, on decision after decision after decision. Do we want tunas or not? We can have them or not. We can kill the last one, eat the last one, or we can protect the last few and make sure that there's a chance at least that they'll be out there. We stopped with whales and whales to, in some measure have recovered. Not all of them, and they're not back where they were a hundred years ago or even, well, certainly before we began to take them seriously, but there are more gray whales, there are more humpback whales, there are a few more blue whales. The trend is moving in the right direction. And we can do that with trees. We can do it with freshwater areas. We can do it with frogs. We can do it with the ocean. Which way is it going to be, (laughs) my grandson asks. So you heard about my wish. I have another wish. I wish we could all come back here in 50 years. But even in 10 years, even in five, in a way, 10 years today is like a thousand years of times past because everything is moving at such a pace. And I believe, I do believe, partly because you're all here, you're all interested in thinking and planning and wondering about the future. That's cause for hope. And I, for one, am a hopeaholic. And I ask you to join me in that endeavor. Thank you. (laughs) 